to thank the AAG for hosting me yet again and to apologize for my failure to achieve any kind of gender balance among my critics. I really did try, but the only man that I found fell by the wayside at the last minute, unfortunately. And consequently, here I am, surrounded by critical feminists, as has happened frequently in the past. Um, it's very wonderful to me at the AAG in San Francisco, not only because I've always loved San Francisco and enjoyed the AAG, but because we live part-time just across the bay in Berkeley. And every year we say to ourselves, oh, are we going to go to that foreign country yet again from London? And we think maybe we shouldn't do it anymore because it has become in the United States in some ways almost a foreign country. And then we come here anyway and it turns out it doesn't feel foreign at all. It feels in many ways just right. So I hope that you'll bear with all of us while we try to unravel all the changes that have happened in the past 30 years or even 300 years that have made the past not just a foreign country but increasingly a more and more domesticated one. And I'm sure my critics will take me to task on both of those counts. Thank you very much, David. Can you hear me all right? Good. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I was introduced to this book uh, about 30 years ago. It came out, I was a graduate student at Syracuse University. And uh, rereading the revised, and it is significantly revised version of the book, felt like visiting an old friend. Uh, Yes, it's a new book. Uh, the basic core is the same, uh, but through time it has matured, become more nuanced, uh, even more humorous than I remember, David, and uh, that's a good thing. So the past is a foreign country. What a fantastic metaphor. Like a foreign country, the past is something we can never fully experience. Yes, we can study it, learn its customs, languages, dress, foods, but we will never truly be a part of it. And given the polyvocality of interpretations of the past that are out there, perhaps it's more accurate to consider the past as many foreign countries. And we as explorers, as researchers, citizens, select the countries that most interest us. Hence, and David makes this point very clearly in his book, there is a, a lamentable erosion of any collective past that we might share. And in that uh, erosion, there's a limiting in our understanding of each other. So revisiting this book, like revisiting places we've been to before, is valuable and rewarding. Again, when I first read this book, I was a young graduate student in the late 1980s, and many of its concepts were new to me, especially the constructive and competing interpretations of the past and how they influence the present. I was especially drawn to the discussion of landscape and historic preservation in the book. What is the value of preserving a place so that generations can say, in this place, Thoreau lived in a cabin, or Pablo Neruda wrote his poetry, or Mother Teresa was born? One of the reasons this book has resonated with so many, and I checked this morning on Google, there's over 5,000 citations to the book, David, is its interest in the physical expressions of the past through relics, landscape, historic preservation, rather than limiting our understanding of the past through, say, archives. Seeing the past in the present landscape is an eminently geographical approach. And it is an approach that's shared by other scholars as well in, in history and fields like landscape architecture. 
trained as a cultural historical geographer, I was drawn to the idea of the palimpsest, the layering of places by different authors, the silences of the landscape, something that Don Mitchell so eloquently pointed out, and the historical lumpiness that is all around us. I share with David the sentiment that passionate pursuit of the past is less debilitating than the lack of concern for the past altogether. And that by knowing something about the past of a place is to begin the process of caring for it. Or as David writes, to know is to care, to care is to use, to use is to transform the past. Continually refashioned, the remained past continuously remolds us. Returning to Lowenthal three decades later, there is so much to admire in this book. One can turn to any section of this 600-page tome and gain a new appreciation for nostalgia, aversion to the past, the heritage enterprise, and the contradictions inevitable of selective remembering and forgetting. The book is rich in literary quotes about the past and the works of historians, philosophers, and even the popular press. Other ready sources for David include paintings, photos of ruins, historic buildings, or places recreated for educational or nostalgic purposes, <laughs> such as Plymouth Rock or Stonehenge, Stockholm. There are references to television and film, including Dalton Abbey, and there could be, uh, but these areas I think could be explored so much more because I think in many ways these shape our collective memory of the past more than um, scholarly works. Conceptually, the book offers diverse approaches to engagement with the past. And as one reads it, uh, they're forced to consider their own engagement with the and so oftentimes in reading this book, you put it down and you have to reflect uh, very deeply about how you do your work and, and think about uh, the past all around you. But what's also striking to me as I read this book was the relative limited scope of its empirical examples, which are mostly from the Anglo-American world. Given the more globalized world we are in, one would like to see engagement, and it does exist, with other pasts, such as the works about uh, Cambodia by James Tyner, or The Gambia by Judith Carney's work on black rice, or even William Denison's engagement with the demographic collapse in the Americas. I think that there are many ways in that scholars in the future uh, might want to engage in alternative sources uh, that, other than the ones that David has used, when they mount their expeditions to the past. And some that occurred to me was the way that, the richly layered way that music informs our understanding of the past. Um, a traditional approach, very Saurian, of domesticated plants and animals and what they tell us about the past religious practices and how they inform our understanding, or the celebration and replication of particular landscape forms. One opportunity that I think was lost or not uh, pursued in this revision was engaging maps and mapping in the ways we know our past. The visual turn in history is very important and it's been significant in the popularization of our understanding of the past, and David notes this. But mapping is one of our best tools. There is a new generation of visualizers exploring the past in innovative ways, and this deserves our attention. Here I think of the work of Anne Knowles and the visualizations that she's done in World War II and the Holocaust. Or the work of a colleague, Chris Tucker, who created Map Story that allows uh, anyone to contribute uh, spatial and temporal data to produce animated maps, and the data are shared and verifiable, so that 
There are visualizations on map stories of the rise of prisons across the United States from 1700 to the present, and it's stunning to see this fold out before you. So the basic structure of the book, and I just want to comment on the four themes, and then I'll turn it over to my esteemed colleagues. David has organized the book into the ideas of wanting the past, disputing the past, knowing the past, and remaking it. So, in wanting. Here there's a rich discussion of the role of nostalgia, time travel, the benefits and the burdens of engagement with the past. And when reading this, I had a flashback to a, a routine by the comedian Louis C.K., who talks about white male privilege. And I won't try to imitate his voice, but those of you who know it can imagine. He says, hey, as a white guy, I get into a time machine, and it would be awesome. I could get out anywhere. I could go back to year two, and they would say, welcome, sir. Here's your table. <laughs> but that's probably not true for people of other races, and it certainly wouldn't be true for people of other gender. So who wants the past, and what past do we want? Uh, we uh, often are interested in preserving uh, landscapes, reconstructing them, to provide us a meaningful anchor. And it's striking that so much that we know about historic preservation really comes from the European experience, and much of that was driven by the rebuilding of Europe that happened after uh, two colossal wars. But wanting the past can be very messy and, and disenfranchising. So in my own experience in Latin America, I've done work with uh, geographers Patricia Solis and Maria Adamis in Panama City. And we've examined the consequences of creating a World Heritage Site in the Casco Viejo. The story is a familiar one, an area that was decrepit, densely settled, and considered by the authorities as lawless and was slowly emptied out and restored so that national and foreign visitors can enjoy a cleaner, safer, and attractive historic old town. The heritage designation allowed the physical space to be preserved, yet the social space was obliterated. In disputing the past, David takes us through this very important discussion of how certain uh, places and times engage the past more than others. And he gives rich examples from France, the United Kingdom, and the U.S. In particular in the U.S., which is often seen as very anti- or ahistorical, he writes that industrialization, mass immigration, ever more noisome, odious cities, heightened longings for an imagined Jeffersonian Arcadia. Old elite retreated defensively into historical myth, as an elusive wasp heritage, relics of the colonial past offered a seemly escape. I've been struck in my years of working in Latin America how increasingly as the past is being disputed, there has been an assertion especially of indigenous contributions, Amerindian peoples, the recognition of indigenous lands and languages, and in some cases, the very active political engagement indigenous leaders. His third section on knowing focuses on three areas, memory and the problems of memory and of course the benefits, history and more the scholarly enterprise of, of writing about the past and relic. And in terms of knowing, one of the things that we probably all hope for as scholars is to write something that connects with large numbers of people and changes their understanding of the past. And in this regard, I'm a huge fan of the journalist historian Charles Mann and his writing of the books 1491 and 1493. Well-written, synthetic, and engaging, Mann lays out a familiar tale, at least to many Latin Americanists, that the Americas over 500 years ago were more populated, better fed, and relatively disease-free. But this fundamentally changes our understanding of the Americas as the pristine myth 
of the relatively empty paradise to one that was aggressively depopulated and even rewilded for its first 300 years. And that kind of knowing can be profound, especially when it's shared widely. Finally, in remaking the past, uh, David engages these important activities of preservation, replication, restoration, reenactment, fabrication, erasing, abridging. In many ways reminiscent of the themes that Benedict Anderson develops in his important work, The Invention of Tradition. The remaking section and the epilogue raises many important issues, but settles on the notion of, and I quote, informed tolerance toward our total legacy is a necessary condition of enhancing the present and enabling the future. So this led me to consider the city I've lived and worked in for the last quarter century, Washington, D.C. It's a city that uses its built environment to remember its past. And since Lowenthal's first book came out, there have been many additions to the historic core, the Washington Mall, as it's known. There's been the National Museum of the American Indian, the National World War II Memorial, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial, which also includes the first uh, monument to a first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt the Korean War Veterans Memorial, and Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial, and the soon to be open National Museum of African American History and Culture. These physical expressions of our past that have become, uh, I would argue, a past that's more inclusive, are important to building a shared identity. And I was reminded of this importance about a decade ago, when I was uh, uh, visiting the Lincoln Memorial with my two boys, they were racing up ahead of me, and as I was catching my breath, I noticed a man next to me who had bent down to the steps, and there are many steps, and placed his hand on a plaque that was embedded in the marble. And the man was carrying a, sm a small child, one or two year old, and he placed the child's hand on this uh, plaque and said, this is the place where Martin Luther King gave the I Have a Dream speech. It was those, that monument I've been to many times, those steps I've walked up many times, thousands of other people, I had never seen that plaque so subtle. You had to really look for it. And uh, it speaks to the efforts, to, until a few years ago, that was the only monument to Martin Luther King in the city. Today, of course, uh, there is a, a hard to miss Martin Luther King Memorial on the edge of the Tidal Basin, between the monuments of Jefferson, Lincoln, and Washington. And it is an attempt to expand our embrace of who we are as a people, and to build a broader sense of we. We are never done with the past. And as Lowenthal concludes, the past is integral to our being. This book invites us to live courageously with its totality and to think purposefully about how the past surrounds us and informs us in who we are and who we can be. It will also continue to inspire future scholars to reflect upon the past around them, engage it, shape it, and share it, so that we might be better anchored in the polyglot world in which we live. Thank you, David. apologizing for reading off the computer. There was a very long line at the printer, so I don't usually do this. Um, 
It's interesting to me that David is an historian who landed in a geography department, whereas I'm a geographer who landed in a history department. I'm not sure why David ended up in the geography department, and that's one question that I would like to have uh, for him today, later on. I expect there's an interesting story there. As David makes pretty clear in his book, Americans have little appreciation for history, although we have something of a mania for heritage. I was a little different growing up with the football coach for my high school history teacher. I had pretty much no interest at all in history. Um, I thought it was a complete waste of time when there were so many other more important things to be getting on with. So I took as few history classes as possible in college. Just as David describes, guilty as charged. Um, these sentiments, I fear, though, are becoming even more widespread as attested to by the precipitous decline in enrollment in majors in history departments around our country in the last few years, on the order of 10 to 20 percent declines per year in many cases. But it was while I was at college at UT Austin that I first met Dennis Cosgrove. And it was Dennis, I think, who first got through to me about the importance of history in general and of history for geography with his amazingly persuasive style of teaching and his boundless knowledge of just about everything. Over the years, his mentorship and friendship <coughs> continued to persuade me of the importance of history. And this is one of my unexpected connections to David Lowenthal and his work. Dennis would not have become a geographer without the intervention of David Lowenthal, who was the external examiner of his PhD thesis at Oxford. Um, and I believe Dennis was very positively influenced by your work, David. And that legacy came flowing through to me, even though I did not really know it at the time. My other connection to David is through my dear mentor at Berkeley, David Hoosen, who many of you probably knew. David Hoosen thought very highly of the teachings of David Lowenthal and his work. And David's great appreciation of history also shaped my development as a geographer in significant ways. Now, I've met David Lowenthal only once before, just a few years ago at the home of David Hoosen and his wife, Carrie Abby Margaret McKenzie Hoosen. Um, unfortunately, this was after David Hoosen had passed away, and I miss him and Dennis more than I can say. Now, David Lowenthal's first edition of this book was widely feted, and this revisited edition is already starting to receive glowing reviews by bookstores. Um, the book is a really staggering compilation of sources marshaled with vigorous and persuasive argumentation to make its multiple main arguments. It is masterful and should be read widely. It is, however, simply too big and complex to try to address in its entirety when we read the wonderful job of hitting every major uh, theme. So I have chosen instead uh, to focus on just a couple of items. I would like to highlight that at the end of this book, it seems to me David is ultimately asking a very important question that Dennis Cosgrove was also asking about a decade ago, although in different words. What does it mean to live a good life? David asks this question throughout the book, really, but at the end, by quoting Václav Havel, to very good effect. Um, and Dennis asked this question when he insisted on the importance of taking time for reflection in our geographical work. I think many of us ask this question for ourselves at some point, or maybe multiple points in our lives and careers, and it is an important one with which to grapple. We can try to lead a good life in our personal world, with home and family, but very importantly also in our professional world, at work and in public. In my opinion, David Lowenthal is helping all of us to do just that with this book, by inviting us to think about the various uses of history and the history of the multifarious uses of history, um, he's giving us the gift in many ways of reflection. As Marie pointed out, you can't help yourself as you read the book. One of the most important points that David makes in this book, I think, and I think it was also in the first edition, but I confess I haven't read that one, is that Anglo-Europeans did not begin to conceive of the past as different from the present in substantial ways until about the late 18th century. And it was about this time that history began to be put to what I would call political uses uh, in the interests of various powerful actors. As David puts it, at this time the past, quote, became cherished for validating and exalting the present. 
I have found in some of my more recent research that this was also about the time that many Anglo-Europeans began to perceive the environment in many places like the Mediterranean Basin and the Middle East and North Africa as degraded and ruined environments, late 18th century. A large and growing body of research from paleoecology to rangeland science and arid lands ecology, however, is making a very strong case against these old interpretations in effect contradicting many of George Perkins Marsh's claims of degradation uh, from 1864 in his landmark book, Man and Nature. Instead, this research is pointing to the great age, dating back to the mid Holocene and beyond, of the typical Maquis landscapes on the one hand, and to the incredible resilience and ecological robustness of the Mediterranean basin in the Middle East and North Africa in many places. The high rates of biodiversity in much of this broad Mediterranean region are thought to be, at least in part, due to these landscapes being deeply humanized over millennia. This is the disturbance diversity hypothesis. Now the difference in these two interpretations between that which George Perkins Marsh first laid out for us uh, and these newer interpretations of resilience and variability, these two interpretations of landscape history have great political import because they guide very significant decisions about development and environment programs, and even about national agricultural and other land use programs that impact the daily lives and livelihoods of a great many people around the world. So how we narrate the history of landscape change in this region and many others, as in, uh, as in many places in the world, is a powerfully political act. For example, Brand new research has just demonstrated that two centuries of tree planting in Europe, for example, which was done in the name of reforestation, protecting the watershed, and reestablishing the balance of nature, has actually exacerbated and not abated or ameliorated climate change problems. So a question I have for David, and it's a really serious question, um, is how could the lessons from your remarkable book be applied to what many call environmental history because the emergence of environmental history as a sub-discipline is often dated by historians only to the 1970s, whereas geographers, as everyone in the room knows, have been studying the history of landscape change for more than a century and doing it very nicely. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, I actually think there's lessons for environmental history in this book that we could talk more about later. Um, related to this, I would like to ask David what his thoughts might be about all of the academic energy being placed on the so-called Anthropocene right now and related work on climate change. How can the lessons from this book help to inform the debate in a constructive way? Um, or can they? And hint, hint, I think they can. So. Um, I would like to conclude by encouraging David not to be too disheartened at what he seems to see as a postmodernist claim that all historians are partial and selective and that they don't believe in truth anymore, or that truth has come to be passe. I, too, lose patience with too hard a line on postmodernism and, and what I would call very hard constructivism. However, I feel that it must be acknowledged that all knowledge is constructed to a degree and that knowledge is often put to political uses in the ways that stories, including histories, are told. Because they're very often told for very particular reasons to accomplish very particular things. And sometimes the goals of such stories are far from noble, aimed at extracting resources from less powerful populations or countries, or trying to exert political control in some way. David hints at this in the book, but I wish he had spent a little more time on these issues. But of course, the book was already so long. I'm sure your editor at some point said, I'm cutting off. <laughs> um, so taking seriously the histories constructed by women, by formerly colonized peoples, and by other marginalized groups, I believe has the potential to widen our understanding of the world, historically and otherwise, and might in some cases lead to a less inequitable world and potentially also to fewer environmental problems. And this is one thing that I found myself wishing there had been more of in this book. But I will be returning to this book for many years to come. It is highly readable, very fun in many places, lavishly illustrated, and intellectually omnivorous. I, I don't think I've ever met anyone who's read so many different things. I encourage everyone here today to enjoy this book and reflect on what it means to lead a good life. And David, 
Let's discuss it more over more wine and lunch in Karayagi's lovely garden sometime soon. study the past. Few endeavor to shape the future. But that's just what David Lowenthal has done. In the past is a foreign country's first edition, and now ever more powerfully in the past is a foreign country visited. To understand this, I begin with the first book. We must, after all, start with the past. If you look at the citations on Google Scholar for the past is a foreign country, something happens that begins to suggest the greatness of this work in its first incarnation. Of course, the number, as Marie mentioned, is vast. But though the book was published in 1985, before today's undergraduate students, most of today's graduate students, and even some of today's new faculty members were even born, <laughs> that number grows. It grows every single day. So when I checked in late January, I was already terrified then. It was 4,937. By March 23rd, that number had risen to 5,160. In two months, the past had gained over 200 citations, about four per day. <laughs> I know the book was 30 years ago. Not yet three months into 2016, I saw new citations to the past in texts in Spanish, French, and German, along with Russian and Norwegian. And many of those engagements are by the newest generation of scholars, the ones most likely not to have been born yet when the original edition was published. Not just in geography or history, but already in 2016 in a master's thesis called On Shaving, Barbershop <laughs> Violence in American Literature. <laughs> and a PhD dissertation called Curating Opera. From areas of, areas of policy and environmental management, like with a book called Global Green Infrastructure, Lessons for Successful Policymaking, Investment, and Management. And even in that quintessentially 21st century era, uh, area, digital social networks, as with the book Mood and Mobility, Navigating the Emotional Spaces of Digital Social Networks. The past, David's book, has become so significant a book that it continues to be formative of new scholarship even after three decades. So then, why would a senior scholar whose work has had and continues to have so capacious, so grand a reach, revise his major work? Not because he just wanted to update his case studies, but because he has so much more to teach us. Just when we think we're living in a new era, David steps in to show us its links to the past. And then just when we think that this era is like that of the past, David steps in to show us how different our, pre our present truly is. And just when we think that historical geography is devoted to documenting the past, David steps in to show us how the past should shape our future. And that is quite some undertaking. We've all heard we're in an information age where legions of facts are at our fingertips and where those facts are increasingly accessed through new technologies. A world where bigger and bigger data means that new gadgets replace the old ones with dizzying speed. A world focused on the present and possibly the future. But our rapid replacement ethos, as David points out, means that we are actually living in a world ever more filled with the past. And, he cautions, as we embrace a more capacious past, its very proliferation redoubles the threat of obese excess. Can we get too much of the past? And what does that mean in our world today? 
These are the first new questions that Revisited poses. But as Revisited reveals, this is not just about quantity, it's also about quality. This is not our same old past. Over the last 30 years, we have labored mightily to democratize our past, making it more inclusionary. Where once, as David points out, the preserved past included buildings only stately and homes only kingly, it now extends to poor farms, pump houses, and public toilets, and equally to the very people who live in, work with, or visit such places. Today, we live not only in an age of increased egalitarianism in our past, we live significantly in an age of entitlement around possessing and participating in that past. Today, the growth of collectibles and enthusiast groups devoted to particular pasts, the emergence of online auction sites like eBay, reality TV shows like Antiques Roadshow and American Pickers, but also the proliferation of broad-reaching and inclusive historic districts in towns and cities like HPOZs, the Historic Protection Overlay Zones in the US, and the creation of increasingly fast and newly inclusive archives where every tweet is archived and made accessible by the Library of Congress, where anyone can sign up for a StoryCorps interview, which will also be archived and made available online by the Library of Congress, where the items left behind at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial are gathered nightly by the National Park Service, saved, and then exhibited online. Today, all this means that ordinary individuals are not only more connected to the past than ever before, but also more involved. It's not just that more is preserved and more different things are preserved. It's that more people expect to be able to be part of the past and its preservation. It's that we hope to find a valuable antique treasure amongst our taken for granted possessions, as on Antiques Roadshow. It's that we hope to be able to have something meaningful to us preserved and restored, as on American Restoration even when the price is more than the market will bear. It's that we now know that our voices and our memories will linger on in tweets, in audio recordings, and even in commemorative artifacts. The past has protruded into our present, and it is ours to shape. And here is precisely both the book's greatest shift in the new edition and its greatest contribution. This is an emboldened David Lowenthal, writing not only as master chronicler of our complexly shifting engagements with the past, but now also as sage advisor. It is here, in the new book's conclusion, that an authorial voice, both strong and wise, emerges to offer comfort as well as counsel. Though it remains important for scholars of the past to document how painful and shameful pasts are overlooked and overwritten, denied and demolished. David, in the past revisited, chronicles a shift over the last three decades that, attempt, that attempts to embrace not just the rose-colored past, but the blood-stained one as well. But the past revisited does more than chronicle such shifts. Here, David advises us how to move them further forward. Such dark pasts, he counsels, should neither be removed, should be neither removed from our landscape nor expunged from our narratives. Removing them from the present and the future, excuse me, removing from the present and the future such aspects of our past does more harm than ignoring them once did for it projects to our future a past whose lessons we have failed to learn. In David's words, quote, we need to embrace the vile along with the valiant, the evil with the eminent, and the sordid and sad, as well as the splendid, for the whole of our past is our legacy. When we can do this, when we can acknowledge, accept, and even embrace all of our pasts, 
not for their crowded quantity in a digital age, and not only for their apparent inclusiveness in an era of entitlement, but when we can understand the past for its lessons for our future, then we can, in David's words, live courageously with its totality. So where will we stand when the past revisited has seen 5,000 citations on Google Scholar, assuming there is a Google Scholar by then? <laughs> when this new book is engaged in so many languages by scholars, including a generation of those not yet born, from so many different fields and practitioners from so many different disciplines. What I'd like to suggest is that just as the first edition transformed our understanding of the ways that the past is made meaningful in the present, we'll revisit it, we'll visit upon our future, not only a critical understanding of this newly pervasive past, past simultaneously more democratic and more individually acquisitive, but that revisited will help us and those who will succeed us to shape from all of our pasts a future as complex as we can imagine it, as rich with life's pains as it is with life's pleasures, equally able to mourn our losses and condemn our missteps as we are able to celebrate our successes. That, I believe, is not only the book's bequest for our future, but also David's. For that, I believe, we shall all be very grateful. David, I thank you. I think, is this on? Is this on? Yes. 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 My far too generous critics and acknowledge a few of their points and enlarge on them a little bit before asking all of the rest of you to react, reflect, and complain, <laughs> perhaps. But there are, as in my book, so many issues were raised by the commentators, and had we had the fourth, who noted that I dealt very little with the new media and its impact on how we view the past. What were the ways that the new media is reshaping our past? And I never got to that until the epilogue of the book, when it struck me what television and the internet were doing to our minds, to our capacity to inform ourselves, to our capacity to bring information into some kind of collective wisdom. As Diana Davis asked, we need to find more about the good life. And I am so happy that that issue was raised by really all three commentators. Caring about the past <coughs> caring about the past is not only 
important, life-enhancing, and a lot of fun frequently. It's something we can hardly ever avoid doing because we are made up so much of the past. We are so indebted to the past for the whole way that we know things, understand things, inhabit things, are born in them and die in them. We can't avoid our indebtedness to the past. What we must do, it seems to me, was to acknowledge that indebtedness and enjoy it instead of regretting it as much as we're sometimes tempted nostalgically to do, regretting it in the sense, oh, things were better back in the old days when I was young, or when my parents were young, or before my grandparents were born, when the world was innocent. The world, of course, was never innocent like that. I liked, among the many points that have been raised here, the question, the point that you made about relics and the fact that we use relics not only because we like to collect them, because we admire them, because we think they're beautiful, because they're evocative, but because they're like a slap in the face sometimes. They tell you things that books do not tell you or cannot tell you in the same way. The example in my book that was my favorite was the wonderful little essay by Virginia Woolf describing her visit to the Carlisle's house in London back in Cheney Walk and how she said once you go into the kitchen of that house you realize something that none of the biographers can tell you or have told you and never could tell you nearly as well as when you enter that kitchen and you see the well in the bottom of the kitchen and the pump from which all the water has to be brought up every day, four times a day, to boil, to cook, to clean, up four flights of stairs with one maid and the mistress of the house, and how this had to be done time and time and time again, because this, the Carlisles were fanatical, cleanly Scots, and nothing must ever be dirty. To live like that, even in a relatively well-to-do household in London in the 19th century, was a trial and a torment that very few modern families could understand, unless you go into the kitchen and see the well and the pump. So it's the physical remnants of the past, those physical presences that still surround us if we know how to look at them properly, are the things that really bring the past home to us. Diana asked, why am I, why was I teaching in a geography department? <laughs> if you really want to know the answer to that question, you have to come tomorrow <laughs> to the session on Jean Gottman that has been organized by our friends, the Mascaras, when I will try to explain how it was that through Jean Gottman I came to first be in a geography department and ultimately then to teach in one. But generally speaking, I have never found 
geography and history to be all that different from each other. There are differences in personality between the two. Geographers are, generally speaking, more generous, more open-hearted, <laughs> more open-minded than historians. Other historians like to pride themselves on some of these things. So for me, having been in geography departments much of my life has been not a total joy ever, but one that continually opens up to new possibilities through students, through travel, through an attempt to understand the extraordinary features of our wonderfully diverse world. Entitlement. This is one of the most worrying features to me of the current way in which we view ourselves in relation to the past. That we're entitled to our past, whereas in fact all of us are inheritors of so many multiple pasts that if you start looking and trying to understand how we are what we are, you need always to look beyond the village, beyond the tribe, beyond the nation, to the whole wide world and all of its multiple influences, its literature, its painting, its music, its architecture, that we're all, in fact, cosmopolites if we only recognized that we were, that we share in common an attachment of one area or another to all of these things together, even those of us who pretend to be iconoclasts and say, oh, this is no longer what we like about ourselves, so we'll get rid of it. People have always done this throughout history. Those who have complained about ISIS continually forget that the Puritans did more or less exactly the same thing not that many centuries ago. I want simply to throw out one final query to all of you, and that is, if the past is a foreign country, and I think in many ways it is a foreign country. Why do I think it's a foreign country? It's because when you start looking at any aspect of most pasts, you find that you can't properly understand it in the way that you are pretty sure the people who lived back then did. And there are many reasons for this. First of all, people living back then didn't know what was going to happen next. We know what was going to happen next, more or less, back then, because we have lived through it since. This makes the past always different from the present. Secondly, we don't know the past because we cannot with our present senses experience what it was like to have lived back then, wearing the clothes that they wore, scratching our heads the way they did to deal with lice, dealing with sudden illness and death as an everyday aspect of almost every family's life, dealing with an understanding of our relation to the next world, that undiscovered country that Shakespeare wrote about, in a completely different frame of mind from them. And finally, as Carlyle put it, and I quote this too in my book, when he was complaining about being unable in the 19th century 
to write about the 17th century Puritan and Catholic England that he wanted to describe. He said, it's not just that the materials are all scattered all over the place and incomprehensible or scribbled over so that you can hardly read them. It's that the frames of thought that people had are so utterly unlike our own that we cannot even begin to imagine what the past was like. And he put this particularly in terms of religious faith. He said, the age of those Puritans, the age of those Catholics, was an age that has gone so completely from us that we cannot even, we know that it was an age of faith, but we cannot bring ourselves to understand how it felt to be in that age of faith. And so that time is gone. It's not only gone from our understanding, it's gone so completely we cannot recapture it. So why the hell try? Well, why the hell try is because recognizing these differences should inspire us with such curiosity, not despair, that we should try anyway, because trying is imagining, and imagining the past is almost as good as understanding it. <laughs> First of all, a round of applause.